We join now, though, by Daniel Osorio, president of Andean Capital Advisors, who's written a white paper on how to normalize the Venezuelan economy. And we're not saying that this is going to be immediate. Obviously, there are much more pressing issues for the Venezuelans. But talk to us about your ideas for for Venezuela when the situation calms down and gets a, a little bit better and a little bit more easy to work with. Sure. I think the crisis that uh, Venezuela is living through right now has, is not one of a political or economic crisis. It is as if there was a natural disaster. It's as if it's recovering from a war or about to hopefully recover from a war. I think regime change is imminent. Um, it, the pressure against the Maduro regime rises every day. Uh, the humanitarian crisis um, becomes more acute every day. But then the question is, what happens the day after? Mr. Giusti spoke of uh, increased investment from abroad. That is going to be a must. And something that we have to focus about as the international community, as investors, is how do we help Venezuela normalize, become again like its peers of once, of once upon a time of Colombia, Peru, Chile, and not its economic peers of today, which are Cuba, Haiti, Nicaragua. Your clients, though, must be absolutely in anticipation of the day when they can get back into Venezuela, right? Yes, it has liabilities of $130 billion, as you point out, but there are so many natural resources and so many, you know, old business interests in Venezuela that could just be revived, no? It's undeniable that Venezuela has 300 billion barrels of proven oil reserves. Um, it's undeniable that the opportunity set there is going to be fascinating. But what I think the investment community understands in this particular crisis is that Venezuela needs time that valuable commodity of time. And to rebuild that country, they're going to have to be afforded some flexibility in order to be able to return oil production from a million barrels a day currently to a million and a half, two million within three years, four years, and then hopefully back up to three and a half million barrels where they were before the Chavistas came to power. Daniel, is there an obvious kind of benchmark, an obvious country that has been through something similar that we can use uh, as a point of comparison here? It's interesting you ask. Uh, a country that I've spent a lot of time studying is Iraq. Iraq, uh, 20 years ago, produced a million barrels a day, had an economy, had shrunk uh, to, uh, to $20 billion nominal GDP. Fast forward to 2019, they now produce 4.5 million barrels a day, and that economy is $250 billion nominal GDP. So the path that Iraq has taken, and even though there is some fragility as far as the politics are concerned, the path to economic development, economic recovery, economic recuperation of Iraq is one that I hope to see in, in Venezuela. The Chinese are already in. The Russians are definitely already in. What role will they need to play? We have a, a whole slew of creditors here, the Russians, the Chinese, as you mentioned. Um, Rosneft, the state-owned uh, Russian oil company. Um, uh, oil servitus companies that are owned money, owed money. Uh, bondholders for the sovereign, bondholders for the oil company, PDVSA. Um, my thesis is that they should bring all those liabilities together, which equate, as you say, to about $130 billion, and establish a structure called patient capital bonds. Patient capital bonds allow the country time at the beginning to get, get its footing back, get its oil production back, stabilize its economy, and then those bonds over time uh, would amortize, uh, giving the country um, some breathing room in the near term, rather than going into a litigious process like we saw in Argentina, where Venezuela and its companies would be locked out of the international capital markets for 15 years. That is exactly what Venezuela does not need. Our bureau chief in Caracas has written a story about uh, steakhouses being, you know, full in Venezuela even as people are starving outside the door and there's a million percent inflation. He says, whoever has got it right, there's no question Caracas has been plunged into a new kind of crazy chaos after years of exploding inflation, empty store shelves and desperate shortages of medicine. But the brain drain has not been complete, right? There are plenty of people still in Venezuela that could shepherd Venezuela to better times. The brain drain has not been complete. Venezuelans have really been leaving in mass for about six years or so, I would say. I think the numbers are underreported of how many people have left. I think those numbers are in excess of four million people. This is a country of 30 million people, so it's significant. Um, they've gone to Colombia, they've gone to Peru, uh, they've gone to Brazil, Ecuador. There are people in Venezuela that technocrats, people with ability, people with uh, knowledge of the oil industry, people with knowledge in finance that can help rebuild. But undoubtedly, we're going to need some international capital, uh, both from the multilateral organizations and from the investment community, to get this country 
uh, back to where it used to be. Daniel, who are you pitching in Venezuela or outside Venezuela that plans to return? And do you have competition from the likes of China on your plan for getting, you know, normalcy back into the economy? I think um, those folks that are interested in Venezuela are obviously interested in uh, natural resources, raw materials, also f uh, infrastructure investment, uh, and then um, the, the, the bond markets. Um, so I think there's a lot of interest from a variety of different sectors. There's just so much to do in Venezuela. The Chinese and the Russians, I think the Chinese and the Russians are being actually quite methodical and thoughtful about this. They view Venezuela as another piece in a very large, complicated, complex geopolitical chess match. So when the Russians think of Venezuela, they also think of Crimea, Ukraine, Syria. When the Chinese think about their bargaining position in Venezuela, they also think about the Korean Peninsula. So we need to really think big picture because that is what the adversary is doing. Daniel, the OPEC Plus group are meeting in Baku this weekend. Venezuela will certainly be one of the topics that they will be discussing. How quickly and how kind of what's what will be the delta, the rate of change in terms of in terms of Venezuelan oil output? Were there to be re regime change? Uh, Venezuela's oil industry can get to about a million and a half barrels from a million barrels a day in two years. And I suspect they can get up to uh, two million barrels, so double production in under five years. And the investment that I think would be required would be between 70 and 80 billion dollars over those five years to get back up to two million barrels. If I were investing into Venezuela, and you talked about the creditors and the debtors and the relationship that they're going to have going forward, if I am investing, if I'm taking cargoes out of Venezuela going forward after regime change happens, how concerned would I have to be about those cargoes and the litigation that could go on around them? Very, very. And that's why my suggestion, and that's why I've put forward this, uh, this white paper that several players in the market now have in their hands, and, and academics and people in, in government, of how can we avoid that? How can we create a structure uh, where we can all work together in a collaborative and cooperative fashion at private sector, public sector, Venezuelans, international community, so that we are not caught into, in this kind of litigious quagmire for the next 15 years, both in Venezuelan courts and in, uh, and in uh, international and mainly U.S. courts. Uh, so I think that's one of the main things that needs to be addressed uh, after the humanitarian crisis is, um, is dealt with.